Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. And I'm um, really glad you guys are interested today. And today we have a panelist of very cool people with us. Um, and if you guys use any of the software and products, let us know as well. Uh, just like maybe raise your hand. I'll, I'll kind of ask the room as well, too, so we can know how many people are using certain um, softwares already. Um, so from the left side, this is Jeff Yu. Jeff Yu used to be in um, a major. <laughs> So Jeff, you used to work in board games at Cool Mini or Not, and then now he's going towards Pulse work at in VR uh, as well. And he has a background in animation, and he also did previs on um, Safari, one of the first uh, real-time animated series as well. And uh, now he's going towards uh, gaming stuff. And we have James Martin. James Martin, if anybody recognizes him or knows him, he's a representative of iClone. And uh, if you use iClone or uh, Character Creator, and if you've seen uh, SIGGRAPHs uh, this year, you'll see that they've come up with some really cool stuff that we want to show you. Basically, a lot of mocap and a lot of like the Rococo suits and different things as well. And if you're not familiar with Mark Simons, uh, he has more of an animation and live action background, but also uh, he's been uh, using uh, um, character animator in Adobe. So this is more of 2D real time as well, too. So uh, I'm going to pass the mic around for them to kind of introduce themselves first. Okay. Well, I guess I'm first up to the chopping board then. So uh, my name is Jeffrey Yu, as uh, Ginger has, has mentioned. Uh, so I had a sequential art background and animation. So while I was at SCAD, I did a double major. And one of the things I, I enjoyed was seeing how uh, my love of comics and animation itself could be tied together. Uh, almost seamlessly because of storyboarding. Um, but uh, later on, as I went farther into my, my studies, uh, I found uh, gaming and how my pre-production work itself could also, is also very similar to like what we did for animation too, uh, between gaming and animation. So uh, that eventually led me into uh, working with other groups on uh, like 3D game projects where I picked up Unreal Engine. And from there, it led me to all these other programs like uh, uh, iClone, for example. Uh, there was also a Fuse and Maximo, where uh, we'll, I'll take the, the, the uh, animated data from the mocap uh, 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 mo data and input that into Unreal Engine. And so uh, that was a fascinating process, you know, just seeing uh, how all that tied together. Yeah. How's it going, everyone? My name is Professor James Martin. I'm actually um, at Georgia State University right now as well during the day teaching AR, VR, asset creation, motion capture, and virtual production. I'll show you guys uh, an example of a couple of different kinds of motion capture. Um, my projects include most recently working with Jon Stewart and HBO on the development of one of his uh, failed to launch shows. All of a sudden, political satire wasn't funny anymore. Um, that was funny. And uh, then also Keanu Reeves' uh, latest movie that'll be out next month, uh, Replicas. I was the lead motion capture artist on that. Previs and post-vis artists. So um, a lot of the tools that I use are in the Realusion ecosystem. And of course that plays nice with all of the game uh, development uh, engines, uh, Unity and Unreal. But also CryEngine, Lumberjack, you know, we got to be fair across the board. Really, you know, if it's an FBX or it's a GTLF or something like that, and it's moving towards more of an optimized state, you'll find more and more of our tools in use. Um, <clears throat> we also teach these tools at Georgia State University at the Creative Media Industries Institute, or the CMII. It's the building with the giant screen right there on the corner if you're downtown at all for uh, Edgewood and Auburn. So they're turning all of that from Woodford Park up to the uh, the Woodford um, High Arts Center uh, into the creative corridor here in Atlanta. So we're very focused on helping lift up all of the indie community and then also all of the educationers, our educators and future workforce, right? So where are you guys going? How are you getting jobs in this industry? We talk about that as much as we do industry uh, related projects. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Simon. Um, I have been in the industry for over 30 years now, and I'm closing in on 5,000 different productions that I've worked on. Uh, and it's everything from animation, live action, uh, video games, commercials, industrials, pretty much you name it, I've worked on it. Uh, currently, I am the story artist on The Walking Dead, so make sure you watch it tomorrow night, premieres, uh, and watch The Talking Dead, because they may actually show some of my animatics from the show as well. Um, uh, I'm also currently storyboarding Woody Woodpecker. Uh, I did the feature film that came out earlier this year, but we're also doing an animated series that comes out in November. That'll be on YouTube, so it'll be easy for everyone to find, so check that out. Um, 
how many illustrators do we have in here? Any of you have the, uh, any of the books, facial expressions to draw from? All right, th that's, a, that's some of the books that I've written. I've written 10 books on the industry. Those are by far my best sellers. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, for shame, go buy the freaking books. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, uh, as an illustrator, we all have a mirror that we draw in. I don't know about you, I got tired of drawing my own fucking face. So I created these books of 50 models. Each book has 50 different models photographed all around their head, holding a variety of expressions. It's fantastic to draw from. Um, I also produce courses for lynda.com, which is now known as LinkedIn Learning. Uh, this is one of them here. Uh, I put this up specifically because we're talking about real-time animation. So I created the course on how to use uh, Adobe's Character Animator, which uh, in the samples in there, I've got samples on how to use uh, photography for it, 3D uh, and 2D and stop motion. It's amazing what you can do with it. Uh, we've used it in a lot of different ways. Um, it's, it's just so fucking cool. It, it, it's one of those programs that you get lost in because it's so much fun uh, to work with. Um, oh, as far as story, storyboarding is what I'm mostly known for. I started as a production designer out in Hollywood uh, many, many years ago. I moved to Orlando to open up the Nickelodeon Studios. Uh, so my wife and I were working on uh, developing, designing, and producing most of the shows that a lot of kids grew up on. Uh, everything from Clarissa Explains It All to Allegra's Window to Welcome Freshman to the Agro Crag. I had to help design the Agro Crag for Guts, for any of you who used to watch that. Um, and even Double Dare stunts. Um, and then I left there to work with Steven Spielberg on Sequest. And that's where I started doing live action directing. I was a second unit director on that show as well as doing all the concept art and all the storyboarding on it. Um, and uh, then I started producing animation. I've won somewhere around 200 awards around the world for uh, projects I've written and directed. Um, and then I started helping develop the storyboard software, Storyboard Pro, if any of you use that software for Toon Boom. I came in to help them redevelop the software to work for live action productions. We won an Emmy for it in 2012. Uh, it is the main software that's used in the industry. I train studios around the world on how to use the software. I wrote the main book that's in seven different languages called Storyboards, Motion, and Art. Uh, the third edition is out now. And uh, I also produced the course for LinkedIn Learning on how to use Storyboard Pro. So, so I think the first thing we want to do is visuals. Visuals are more interesting than us talking to you about real time and things like that. So, I mean, since Mark's stuff is pulled up, Mark, do you want to show them a, a little bit about what character animators and kind of explain it a little bit first, too? All right, so character animator, forget that thing. <laughs> They're not hearing me on the streaming. You want me to repeat that? I'm sorry, everybody. I'll repeat it very quickly. So, Adobe's character animator, real time animation using your webcam. Good enough. Okay. So the software, uh, all, you, the biggest challenge is building your assets. Now, I can usually build a character in an hour or two that's functional. You can spend a few days to really make it crazy as far as how much it'll do. Now, you know, it'll track, and I'll show you a demo here of, of different ways that you could do in just a second. But the, uh, what it automatically tracks and moves are your head motions, eye blinks, your eyebrows, your, uh, your mouth. Um, but you can, you can real-time switch if I want to look like my character is yelling, I can just hit Y or whatever I want. So I can do keyboard shortcuts to, to bring in other faces and other series of phonemes. I can also uh, set it up where if I, move, if I turn my head, the character's head will turn, but I can have it where if I turn my head, my character will do a dance or a jig. So you can have certain motions that you do set off certain animations. I can use my keyboard or I can use any number of outside sources, including MIDI, uh, MIDI keyboards, to set off any sort of, of animations that you have already preset. If your character is yelling, throwing fire, jun jumping, running, or whatever. Plus, now we have uh, IK in it, so you can have a character kick a ball, hit a ball, something hit your character, knock it over. It's phenomenal, and at literally every couple of weeks, they're updating it and being able to do more. So it's really, well, for, I found it really easy to use. Um, it, the interface is different than other softwares I've used. So it's kind of a sharp learning curve for an hour. And then, it become, then once you get it, it's like, ah, oh, OK. And then it gets a lot easier. They've, 
And that's the other thing. They're making a lot of changes to make it easier and easier to build your puppets. You build them in Photoshop and, uh, and then import them into, um, into Character Animator. And most of the setup is already done for you. And if you understand sequential animation, that's where you build the different sequences that can be keyboard, uh, that can be run with, with your keyboard. Or now there's a whole bunch of different ways to set up to run. So anyway, let me sh show you this real quick. This will give you an idea of some of what you can do in this. And there's no audio. Everything in this is using Character Animator. Character Animator is an incredible software for real-time animation. This really scared my wife. Every arm movement, I'm just using my keyboard real-time as I'm talking. So if you're in school or, or a teacher or, or have Linda, uh, Linda.com or LinkedIn, you have access to, uh, whoops. What do you need to know for this course? Boy, we're just going to keep looking at me, aren't we? All right. Um, so it, it, what I found was just a little bit of help gets you going. And then there are little things. The more detailed you get, the more things that can happen in it. So this kind of helps you step through everything. But it is really fun to play with. Can we show a little bit of the interface of what it looks like? I don't have it up oh, here. Oh, maybe on oh. YouTube. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Just the interface itself, uh, if we use After Effects, is a little bit more similar to that as well, too. And uh, for illustrators especially, it's something that is relatively very easy to get into. Um, if you are using especially Photoshop or illustrators, you can also start with templates as well, too, because there are templates that are provided. And what you do is you just put in the head, the eyes, and different layers as well, too. And then um, you can just dump it into Character Animator, set up a little bit of uh, what keyboards you want to use. Many ways Character Animator help you add more visual value to your animation. Right. So this, I'll, I'll just kind of point out a couple things on here. Standard use of one front end. So th this is what the interface looks like. So that's actually my, from my webcam. So you can see yourself on, on what's capturing on it. A little claymation work. Here, let me pause it somewhere. All right, so down here, this, all these are different animations that I can have start up and run either with the keyboard shortcut, you can see you know, V for, um, for picking up this bottle, F for fire, uh, W for a wave. Or I can use my mouse and click on one of these visual icons and that animation or that object will appear. Or I can have any of these set up for, uh, like I said, a MIDI keyboard to do it. Or I can set up a motion that I do with my head to also generate any of these things to start working. This is the, this is the live output that you can see, and um, and if you click on, on start, that takes you to, they've got a lot of preset puppets that you can use, and they're free. I mean, it, there's no, um, uh, Adobe is allowing anyone to use them for anything, even commercial work. So they've got a ton of puppets that are on there. When you go to rig, that's when you input your, uh, your Photoshop file, which does have to be layered a very specific way and numbered a very specific way. They make it pretty easy, and they have templates where you can literally just replace the elements that are in those layers with your elements. They make it really simple. And then when you go into record is when, uh, when you can now see what you've got. And you can have multiple layers. You can have multiple characters happening at the same time. You can lay, uh, lay this over live video and 
we could have an animated character interviewing us real time. If you ever watch Late Night with Stephen Colbert, uh, when he has uh, animated God or animated Donald Trump or, or any of those other characters, those are all using this software real time. None of that is pre-recorded. So there's just a, a guy sitting off on the, on the sidelines uh, uh, in the wings of the set interacting with Stephen. So it's, it's just fantastic. So Character Animator, um, the Adobe has been coming out with more and more features, as Mark has said already, too. And with uh, my cartoon president especially, uh, they, they do use that along uh, with uh, After Effects to create the series. And uh, one of the setbacks would be, though, is that sometimes the files are really big as well. Sometimes one character file can go up to like a couple gigabytes. So uh, you do have like a lot of op optimizations to do with like the pitfalls as well. So um, maybe let's do a demo of yours first. What is iClone? What is? OK. Um, well, Character Animator is uh, another akin tool to um, the entire ecosystem for real-time animation tools, right? So uh, Realusion is actually the makers of iClone. And then they also make uh, a flagship product called Crazy Talk. So a long time ago, Viacom actually found that. And uh, many of uh, we actually have Jimmy Kimmel uses Crazy Talk on um, the often uh, on different bits. And uh, so it's real-time animation tools being used in the exact same way that, that uh, he, you know, we're talking about. And so we'll take a look at a couple. Um, and iClone is a 3D real-time animation tool, right? So that was used on replicas um, and then also a variety of other projects. But let's have a look at Crazy Talk Animator um, 3 first. So Crazy Talk Animator is very much like Toon Boom and Character Animator as well. So for the 2D artists out there, the illustrators out there, and especially the storyboard artists out there, because in my courses, we start with concept art, right? So can you clearly convey an idea, pitch an idea, bring that into the workspace, and then clearly uh, define that for uh, potential client work? So I'll just show you some real-time um, project here. So this is actually in Crazy Talk Animator 3. And I'll just throw or double click a project. Now, does everybody understand the difference between real time animation and just animation? Yes? Yes? Right? So, real time means that we get collaborative and creative quicker, right? Instantly, we're able to talk about your material, my IP, your ideas, right? And we can actually edit that. Or if we go live broadcast, we absolutely can puppeteer that. Um, along with a live actor or, or somebody else that's interacting with the character. So it opens up a lot of doors that if you're waiting to render, you wouldn't have otherwise, right? So essentially, Crazy Talk Animator is what I like to call the love child between the 2D engine and the 3D engine, right? And you guys will see what I'm talking about. I'm actually just dragging and dropping a project in here. And I'm actually going to hit play because we're actually going to take a look at real-time animation, right? So here's my... Uh, my best attempt at a, a, a Dirty Simpsons opening, right? But you're getting the audio, you're getting the playback, and you're getting camera movement, right? So it's beyond just the character animation, because all the character animation has speak to animate technology, just like character animator. It has actually motion capture uh, uh, capabilities that shares libraries between the tools. And then also, I can get really specific with my IP, because as you can see, I can brand this. So you can, you can see the peach. And if you guys know what's up with hanging around downtown, you might have been to Mechanicsville a couple of times. So these avatars are, again, real time and set up for sprite-based animation, right? Now, at any given time, because this is my project, I can stop that, OK? And we can talk about what I mean by the love child between a 2D and a 3D engine, because here's what you're actually seeing, ladies and gentlemen. So parallaxing, essentially, a lot of fundamentals that you're going to put into your 2D animation is given to you by the luxury of being in a real-time 3D engine, right? So we can continue the playback. And this is all, again, real-time. So at any given time, if I wanted to select one of these characters, and I'm going to borrow a voiceover artist real quick. All right. All right. And we're going to say, ready? Action. Well, you didn't, didn't give me a script. But let me spray paint this wall. Cut. Too much. See, we're getting collaborative instantly, right? 
And now watch this. I can review that in real time. But even better, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting facial animation instantly generated. Nice. Okay? So that sprite-based movement that you're getting out of Character Creator, you're getting out of Toon Boom, you're going to get out of Crazy Talk Animator. So that's our 2D. Okay? Let's talk about this on a slightly higher level. So for 3D, you have iClone, right? So here's a real-time set that literally in class yesterday I was rendering out as a 360. So you can see I actually had that camera in the chair, right? But let's just talk about the real-time engine for a second as well. So I can look at virtual scenes. I can look at characters. I can look at a lot of different types of animation. And again, we're not going to do it with a $27 million facility that we have down at Georgia State. We're going to do it with a $60 webcam. Okay, so if I wanted to go grab my little Logitech out of my bag, but you know what, I'm even going to go more down and dirty than that. I'm going to use the built-in camera on my trusty Alienware with a 1080 in it, right? Because why not? Now, real time and the optimization of these tools and the democratization of these tools has changed our industry, right? So we're looking for more generalists out there that have all of these kinds of tools in their toolbox. Can you go 2D to 3D? Can you pitch? Can you do creative writing and concept art development? If you're not one of the people that raised your hand as an illustrator in here, you should be. Because you need to take it from here to there and rapid prototype all of your ideas. And real time is important to that process. So I'm going to open up a new project very quickly. We also have character generation tools, right? So where do these characters come from? They come from Photoshop, right? PNGs. We're just setting that up. So if it's a photograph, or it's a tune illustration, if it's coming from Illustrator, whatever your current weapon of choice is. Stay in that ecosystem. Be effective with that tool. Bring that into these other software packages and then animate with those. Everybody make sense there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because guess what? It also spits out sprite sheets. So you go into Unity. Now the same 2D assets that you're animating with that you might be doing cinematics for your game, I don't know, something else you're actually developing sprite sheets with that and your entire aesthetic across all of your media stays the same. Does that make sense to everybody? If you're trying to sell your artwork, it better. Okay? So, and we're getting a little bit of lag here. It's just trying not to think about my, my giant space set. Um, so let me kill that very quickly. Now iClone is in version seven and has Tools like Curve Editor, right? So let's just jump back over to Crazy Talk Animator very quickly and just talk about uh, something else that he mentioned. Nonlinear editing. How many of you guys have edited video or audio in anything? Ever. Wave file. Movie. Rip, ripped, an, ripped an MP4. Hot MP4. Right? Okay. Guess what? You're all dangerous as animators now. Because in these tools, you're going to go right to a timeline, and you're going to be working with the same kind of clips and keyframes that you find in things like audio and video editing, right? So it's a very low entry point to actually start to really manipulate these tools on a high level. Um, let me reopen iClone here. Excuse my messy desktop. Don't look at it if it bothers you. Just don't. Um, so we'll also talk about some other um, types of motion capture that we focus on at the CMI that are real time. Um, I've got a few business cards here, so I'm going to be pretty selective about them, right? But um, basically these are markers, and I'm going to show you a real time performance that goes beyond what we talk about in 2D and 3D, right? And when we need to go past the Uncanny Valley, how many of you know what the Uncanny Valley is? And no, it's not an X-Men comic. No. It should be, though. It, it should be. Like, I'm saying Wolverine versus Brood in the Uncanny Valley. I'm there. Works, right? Anyway, so here's iClub. So basically, again, 3D engine, right? And so now we've got cameras, we've got lights, and we want characters. So I'm just going to set up my workspace here. There we go. So with our character generation tools, you can actually come out of character creator, and that's very much like Daz Studio or, or other character generation tools that rapid prototype these kinds of things. And Taiwan is looking for my serial numbers, and you're not finding them. <laughs> so let me jump over here. We're just going to grab a compelling avatar here. Now, this actually came from Daz. 
but you can start in our character generation system. And we also have a lot of industry partners that are industry leaders uh, in film, television, and a lot of virtual production. One of those partners is Facewear. Anybody heard of Facewear? Have you seen Andy Serkis wearing cool helmets anywhere with cameras on it? You've heard of Facewear. Okay, so here's a real-time avatar. Now, if I just go ahead and hit play um, after my stream gets done loading, I might have reloaded him there. Um, you're going to see things in real time that are automatically going to benefit you, but also notice the shaders, right? You've got global illumination. You've got PBR. Who knows what PBR is? I mean, I'm, just, I'm just fishing for beer. That's it. I love beer. Um, so PBR, <laughs> I qualify. Um, so basically in uh, PBR, that is physically based rendering. So if I bounce image-based lighting off of this avatar, guess what? The coefficient of the light is going to bounce off the skin. I don't walk around knowing the coefficient of colors and that kind of thing. I'm not that smart. Luckily, it is for me. So if I hit uh, just you know play, I can go ahead and start looking around at my scene here. But let's set up some facial animation. This is a very complex process. So I'll show you guys how hard this is. So with Faceware, uh, we have a plugin called Motion Live inside of iClone. Motion Live allows us to take any mocap tool. Oh, wait, there I am. What's going on with my chin? What's going on there? So here's my crappy built-in web camera, right? Now, you can buy a Facewear rig for $15,000. I got one for sale. Who's, who's any takers? Come on, it's in the parking lot, man. I need it. Nothing? Nobody? Tough room. Um, so essentially, $15,000 for that rig. Or my built-in camera is also going to track my face a little bit better if I take the microphone out in front of my mouth and also calibrate. So very quickly, I'm just going to calibrate my face. It's super technical and tough, so try to keep up. Okay, I'm done calibrating. So now I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to go to my plugin and I'm going to go to Motion Live. I'm going to set up Motion Live. This is super technical, you guys. And I'm going to turn it on. Oh, the green light of motion capture. I love it. And then I'm going to go to face. I'm going to pick real time. And I see that that's going to launch my icon. I'm going to go to preview. And now, <sighs> yes. real time facial animation. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, dude. So let's say I want to tweak this. Ah, too much. I'm breaking my rig. Ah, now I'm dialing that rig in. So, let's create some facial animation, shall we? Welcome to SiegeCon. <laughs> well, that was tough. It's a long day. I'm done. See you guys later. <laughs> right? Now, as an animator, by trade, that's money in the bank. Okay? So I can go ahead and disconnect from that, and then I can hit play. Ah, now I've got facial animation. That's real, true facial animation. Let's talk about some of those mocap tools, shall we? So we don't need the mocap tools. I want the mocap tools. I got all the mocap tools, but I don't need them, right? So I can come over here, and if I just want to puppeteer some more posing, uh, let's just go front. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's preview this. Oh, wait, maybe those, uh, maybe those elbows need to come out a little bit. Ah, there we go. Uh, maybe we can come down, maybe uh, toes in. Uh, yeah, he's a better posture there. Okay, a little bit more energetic, please. Thank you. And are we ready? Sure. Let's go ahead and let's record some body motion now with our puppet. Now, I could do this with a walk -em. I could do this with my mouse, or I could just allow it to do all the heavy lifting here. So we're just going to set up this profile, and once I like what I got here, there we go, there we go, there we go, I'm just going to record and play. Okay, setting up character animation should be this easy for all of you. Because with these tools, oh, wait, I've got some collision there. Who hates collision? Woohoo! Shout out to my 3D guys in the room and gals. So, boom. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do a little, uh, little cleanup, a little offset. Okay, so now guess what? That collision is gone. Boom. And I can see that in real time as well because I can go back to the beginning of my scene. And if I want to reset that, boom, I got that. So now I'm cleaning animation. I'm creating animation. I'm doing full body in 3D in under five minutes in real time. Does everybody see the benefit of that? Because guess what? 
Remember that timeline we were talking about? Right here it is. And guess what else? This all goes out, right? So if I want to send this out, if I'm done with this and I say, you know what? Give me this rig. It's time to be an asset. We're going to Unreal. We're going to Unity. I might take it to Photoshop, make some, uh, make some PNGs, and then go into Character Animator. Why not? Right? Because we've got that ability. Now, the ecosystem and the reason this is important is the bridge out is 3D Exchange. So 3D Exchange takes you to Epic. It takes you to Unity. It takes you to the other tools that your artists are using, and here's my rig, and here's all my components. And literally, I can come back over, and in real time, mind you, right? You guys are watching all this development, right? Which means if you're on a computer that's a game-ready machine, and you have this tool, which costs about $250 to get started with, Jeff, Jeff can afford it on his blue gra or his bluegill diet, man. He, he, he's eating bluegill, I'm telling you. Um, so essentially, it's affordable for students. It's affordable for indie developers. It's affordable for everybody, really. So even larger studios can outfit this and put multiple seats on a pipeline, and then everybody's getting faster. And really, it's all about the speed, right? So if we come over and we look for what we've created here on our character, here's our, here's our big, ugly motion clip. Right? So remember, remember the, uh, the, the wave files right, that we were talking about? Guess what, guys? If we drill down on this character and go into the vice theme, here's some of these uh, usual suspects you might be used to seeing. And all of a sudden, this becomes very demystified. So if we dig down into our lips and our voice here, and we look for that facial animation, it's going to be found on our, our track here, and then also all of our motion clips and our keyframes associated with all of that. But what I can literally do is say, you know what? I want all of that in one FBX. Please send that to 3D Exchange. So now I've got all that animation. It's ready to be packaged in an FBX and go out. Anybody want to see how hard that is? OK. Woohoo! Here we go. I press the FBX button. It's tough. It's really technically hard. You guys have to know a lot about game design, development, and 3D animation, and all the stuff that you need to go to school for and spend a ton of money to press that button. So also right here, it's really super tough. Oh, there's Unity. There's, there's Unreal. There's, uh, there's Maya. Anybody ever use Maya? Get out of here. Um, motion Builder. Anybody want to clean this motion up really, really nice? Send that out AAA, ready package to go. Well, you might want to take a trip through Motion Builder. Um, also, axes, Y up, Z up. Who knows why this is good? I, my, my developer does, right? He does. Why? Y up, because you're going to need Y up. That's why. Um, so all of your, uh, <coughs> your source morph shapes, your duplicated objects, your scale, your diffuse textures, OK, your formatting. Right? Your max texture size, guess what? 4K. Take your textures out, make it beautiful. Take it into Substance Painter, make it more beautiful. Because guess what? It's all within our ecosystem, right? So this is all packaged in with your, uh, your FBX inherently coming out. I can play and review in, in uh, 3D Exchange before I send it out. Okay? Why real time is important? Because it's faster than other workflows. Everybody get that? A lot of head nodding. That's good, right? Because if you're faster and more effective with your content creation, you're going to get more jobs, you're going to get on more stuff, your demo reel is going to grow, all right? And you're going to be more effective in your field. And if you're faster than the artist sitting beside you, chances are you're probably going to get the job that they might not. And that's just real talk. For my students, I'm just letting you know, it's a harsh industry out here. And we're all competing for the same gigs, right? So be fast and effective. And if you can do that from concept art all the way through the delivery of a vertical slice of a working game, right? Because if this goes out into Unity or Unreal, now we're doing VR. Now we're doing AR, right? So let me show you guys something cool. We hold this for a second, sir? Thank you. So I'm going to switch to a very technical device, my cell phone. This is what I got my degree for right here. <laughs> this is great. I'll take it back. Thank you, sir. So we're going to switch over just to my phone feed. And unlock. This is the consumer level now. Yes. I'll be the consumer level, but this is just get a 
Ah, there I am. So, does anybody know what they're seeing? That is AR, but that's also volumetric photoreal motion capture. Okay, so where we're going with this and what we're teaching right now is certainly a level that is avatar driven and character centric, both 2D and 3D. But where we're going with it is somewhere completely photoreal, where you are you in the virtual world, and these tools are already in the classroom. So imagine where it's going to be, oh wait, there's Candace Auger. Do you guys want to know who that lady that just popped up on there was? Everybody see that? Oh, there she is. She's my Easter egg. She's my colleague at Georgia State and the Creative Media Industries Institute. She's the reason I'm down there, and she's my favorite lady in the industry. Here's why. She sold a guy named Jimmy Cameron a little, uh, little mocap tool for a movie uh, called Avatar. Still being used on Avatar 2. Okay? So there are some innovators, like this man sitting beside me and myself here in Atlanta, Okay, and there's others that you're very, very, very close to. She also did a little game called uh, Call of Duty. Okay, a uh, little guy named Gollum. She's the only person I know that has Steven Spielberg in a picture with her on her desk with Peter Jackson and James Cameron. <laughs> when I take people beside it, it's, it's, I, just, I, I just sit back and laugh. I'm like, look at that picture. And I just watch people, you know, they, they just lose their minds. This is the emerging technology that we're focused on in game design and development, okay? So I'm going to show you guys just a real quick example of uh, a deployment of all this with, yep, I'm going to switch back. <laughs> Marissa's wrangling wires for me. I am now an official celebrity. By the way, if you're in any city in on the North American continent, I believe, and you need to find out where all the best food is, Marissa Ginger Tonto Vitong, y'all. <laughs> Get with it. Okay, so this is the trailer for Replicas. So Replicas was shot in 2016 in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and we were on for pre-vis, post-vis, and a variety of things. Um, the first thing that we had was this, which this gentleman is going to recognize. So we, we come on board just with animatics uh, and basically just giving us the, the beats, and uh, you'll see that they had this shot and this shot, actually that shot, um, and that was all that they had on board at the time. So. As previous artists, we use iClone in a variety of ways. Um, this is one of the 
and I'm just going to blow through this because my time's almost up. Um, you can see that we do things like stunt coordination with this tool as well. So this isn't just game asset. This also works in film and television. Um, and you can see here those two shots that they had originally uh, married in with some just gorgeous After Effects work. That's neither here nor there. This is all iCloud. So you can see that we uh, gray out everything and essentially the uh, the point is is that we just are focused on the beat and the action, and that wander landing also was in the trailer. Um, also, we worked with Keanu directly to uh, basically develop motion libraries, and essentially when I say that you know we capture directly with him, um, you'll see here, and I can only show a little bit of this, maybe three seconds, so look quickly. Um, if I can get the video file to open. So essentially, here we go, Windows Media, da-da-da, there we go. And uh, you can see that here is my buddy John Wick, and there I am there in the back with my trusty gaming laptop. And you can see we have an inertia-based suit on Keanu there, and we're doing uh, direct um, motion uh, capture in world that is used to create a motion library that was then called upon on stage. So during principal photography, Keanu had an idea of exactly um, what he was going to do in this AR world when he was basically manipulating brains and reconnecting the neuroscience uh, of all of these things about his family. Um, and you can see that the character rig in this, again, was generated through character creators. So you can see we have a virtual Keanu representation that is very much accurate to his um, proportions and body type. Also, even clothing that he was wearing that day on set. Um, I'll show you a couple of things that we did in post-vis and principal photography as well, uh, just very quickly. And then I'll open it up for questions. So this is just a small rough cut. And you can see that uh, we had a... Um, uh, awesome cast in this, Thomas Middleditch from Silicon Valley, one of my favorites. Uh, Thomas was awesome. Um, Alice Eve, Black Mirror, she's out of your league, uh, another super awesome actress. This is 345, and the cool thing about this is iClone was used um, in the motion capture development of this, and it's also four of us. So it's actually the stunt performer, myself, the executive producer, and also the director, all in this one performance. And you saw some of this also made it into the trailer. So 345 is the rig we were working with, and we were able to take those film backs directly and uh, do post-vis overlay of the film back itself after principal photography is done. Uh, Thomas kept breaking scene there, and I got in trouble with the director of photography. So uh, I'll show you one more. And again, sorry, I'm not giving you the full spiel here, but this is still unreleased. So this is uh, a little bit of behind the scenes. And this will be out uh, next month, actually. So the trailer was uh, the 2017 trailer. This will hit theaters in November. And there's John Ortiz and Alice Eve. And then again, you can see that the 345 character is actually represented by this stuntman. And uh, so Danny was doing um, principal photography and a lot of uh, cable work. So when you do uh, characters that have strength and want to throw things around or you have, you know, a superhero, uh, you need to coordinate that motion capture with the actual stunt team as well. Um, so we do things like cable work uh, where stunt guys are flying across the floor and things like that. We'll go in and we'll, we'll um, uh, get all of that motion data for that as well. And that's going to wrap it up. Not yet. Not just yet. Not just yet. Not just yet. Yeah. Well, wow, James, you just like, bam, presentation blew wide. I was like, all the questions I was going to ask was all answered. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 a lot of them. Yes, a lot of them. Yeah. But first, Jeff. And now he's like, oh, no, I'm going after the guy who knows Keanu Reeves. What am I going to do now? How are we going to live up to this? And the other veteran, too. It's like, oh, yeah. So, uh, Jeff, you are also working in some of the previous works uh, of uh, real-time animation. And is the process any different? Uh, like, any different? And also, like, being someone who did not actually come from this field and then learning it yourself, what, any, like, tips or tricks you want to tell people? Yeah, so uh, for the pre-production, well, yeah, so for the pre-production process, it's not too different because you're still doing, you know, the character model sheets. So instead of the 3D model, the characters animated, rig it. Uh, I found uh, used iClone was great too because you can actually do auto rigging in there, and then you can and with Mixamo, it uh, they had it as well too. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Chrome. Uh, 
yeah, if you could uh, just type in uh, Jeff Uart. Yeah, so uh, I used iClone and Mixamo for uh, a 3D game project where it's a first-person detective horror series. And so uh, what I will do in there is I'll create the environment using speed trees and other uh, found assets, which Unreal also has. And if you're any developer, uh, the, these packages will be a godsend to you, especially if you don't have the team that you want. Because uh, the big projects you see, like those AAA companies, they have hundreds of people working together and you know you have like 60 people doing modeling, uh, a lot of uh, animators uh, you know, who, uh, who are able to collaborate together with you know, a larger team. But so for this one over here, this project we only had about eight to 10 people and usually two to three people working in Unreal Engine at a time. Yeah. So the first person motion Unreal Engine has a package that is for that's a, that's like a starter pack. You can actually you can uh, use that and bring it into Unreal uh, into uh, uh, iClone and tweak it. Um, one of the things we tried early on in our development in our R and D phase was we actually tried do, doing like a third person body and then tying the camera to the body, so that uh, if you, if the if the if you hit a keystroke to like have the hand come up with the cell phone or something, you can actually see the, the hand come up in your screen. Uh, to, to make it a little bit more immersive. Uh, there were a couple issues that ran into that though because sometimes the camera like ran into the head so what ended up happening is you have to delete the head so that you don't have that uh, weird camera mesh collision issue. Um, the character over here, uh, yeah, like the, uh, what do you call it, the police dude, um, we used uh, uh, found animation assets and then we tweaked it up in iClone as well too. Um, and when you set up these animations in Unreal, you have to go through what's called a, uh, a blueprint. And so it's almost like a bunch of uh, a hierarchy trees of like how animation is tied together. You have like a base pose, like idle, maybe them just standing there. And then you have other uh, animation montages, like maybe if he's attacking or if he's running, uh, you have to also tie that to different keystrokes as well too. And then uh, when you release the keystrokes, they return back to like the base idle pose. Um, in games, the animation you can't have them too long because uh, when, there's going to be like weird delays and latency if you like release the keys. So usually around like 10 to 15 frames is like the target you want to go for for the animation. Uh, but yeah, uh, large part of this uh, project was uh, was uh, from the Unreal Market, and then some other parts are like customized. So you can see like the the depth you can go um, using uh, like I, uh, using iClone and a bunch of other programs put together. Um, another project I've worked on is Zafari. And if I could find that. So Zafari is a uh, children's animated series. Yeah, you can go ahead and pull it up. And so uh, all the animation is, is uh, ported into Unreal, and then they'll set up the scenes in Unreal, and then they'll set up the camera uh, trails in Unreal too. So uh, while the characters are moving around, you, the camera will also follow this trail. Oh yeah, you can also set animation to the trees too, so they actually move with the wind. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah.
particles. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, dynamic lighting for the, you, you can also use dynamic lighting for time of day shots. Uh, you can actually set up in Blueprint so that uh, based on the amount of hours you set, uh, you can go from day to night and it changes the colors and everything, like it, it's incredible. But yeah, uh, I hope that uh, shows you what you can do in Unreal as well. Yeah. So I think like um, these are like really cool demos and everything as well. But then I think what people might want to do now was think like, am I going to be out of a job? I think like probably one of the biggest questions. Or how do you how do you keep up with this trend? Like you said, like what kind of skill sets you need? Because you did mention that like we need a variety variety of things. And also know like the the studios now are starting to, especially in animation. Probably for people who are in games, they're like, okay, I've used Unreal, I've used Unity. This is not something that's so new to me because this is our, your your world. But in animation, these are things that are actually starting to become more and more like prominent in the pipeline. As sometimes animation follows games uh, kind of technology as well. So I think right now uh, the question would be like, what do you think would be the future of, like if, if, if I want to st still keep my job, what would be things that you want to tell people as well? So <clears throat> you'll find things like the sequencer in Unreal and the timeline in Unity and you're, you're seeing a lot more of the, the tool sets and the ecosystems merging for film, television, and game creation. And a lot of companies are also asking more for gamification of their IP, so movies are releasing with VR. Um, you know, you just had, uh, like, for example, Immortal Vader. Um, anybody see that from ILM? Beautiful, you get to go to Vader's castle. Um, and then I'll, I'll just give you a real world example. Um, Max just accompanied me to Taipei, Taiwan, where he competed in the 48-hour Animation Jam Finals, where he actually was on a two-man team that won a Facewear uh, Best Technique Award in that competition. That competition is actually, the, the grand prize is $10,000 US. So we actually have the local round here where it's just like a 48-hour uh, film festival, but it's a 48-hour Animation Jam. We hosted that at GSU. Um, it's free to enter, so anybody can come in, get down, and start to animate from script to screen. Um, and then we had celebrity judges um, in uh, Taipei, um, one of which was Daniel Grinois from uh, Halon. Um, you guys, has anybody ever heard of Halon? Okay. <laughs> has anybody ever seen Star Wars? Okay. So remember the uh, the Millennium Falcon when Ray is flying that and the big epic scene? Yeah, you know Halon then. Uh, how about Planet of the Apes? Anybody seen War for Planet of the Apes? Caesar, all those monkeys in the beginning, a lot of apes, right? Right? Then you know Halon because they create previs for these movies. Okay, and basically what I just showed you with my Keanu previs is almost shot for shot in instances in the trailer. So it goes all the way through editorial. So it starts with previs artists. So are you out of a job as a game designer? Absolutely not, because you might be a previs artist. So does that make sense to everybody? You're gonna find a lot of your gaming technique and a lot of your creative design technique, whether that's in Max or Maya, whether that's ZBrush or Mudbox, right? Wherever your niche is, even Marvelous Designer for virtual clothing, you know, you literally can find a niche, right? Maybe you're a lighting artist. Maybe you're a virtual scene developer, right? Maybe you're not a C++ and Python, you know, extraordinaire programmer. And that's okay because you're going to find other homes for these tools and you're going to find them in places you probably wouldn't expect to, uh, believe it or not. Well, the biggest thing is building a portfolio uh, and staying up and, and learning. I mean, I literally study and learn more now than I ever did when I was in college. Um, and, and luckily, it's fun now. Uh, when you don't have to worry about grades, life is a lot more fun. Um, so it's like there's in, in storyboarding, uh, which is obviously what I do the most, there's still a tremendous amount of artists who work on paper or they're boarding in Photoshop. Both are antiques. And uh, at my studio, so I own the largest storyboard house in the southern U.S. We just moved here to Atlanta from Orlando uh, earlier this year. I will not hire someone who's not using Storyboard Pro because what we deliver is so fast and so far beyond what you can do in Photoshop or, or, or paper. If you're not using Storyboard Pro, you can't deliver what my clients expect from me. So you need to stay ahead. Now, 
I don't care if you have a degree. In fact, no one in the industry cares if you have a degree. Now, I'm not saying don't get a degree, so it's okay. Don't say that. Because that's where you can learn your skills. But in over 30 years of working in this industry, I've never been asked if I have an education. Not once. Because no one gives a shit. Your portfolio. What can you do for me? Yeah. It's the quality of your work. Period. So don't ever make the mistake. And I see this a lot uh, um, with, when people say, well, I did this for free or I was an intern. Don't say that because all you're doing is taking the value away from your work. Did you do the work? Yes. Then you can do the work. That's all that matters. Don't start your conversation with, well, this was a college project because you just took all the oomph out of what you're showing. Just say, I did this. And stop talking and just let your work speak for itself. Spend those extra hours on your own. How many of us work all through the night just fucking playing around to come up with something new? Right? Uh, when I learned um, uh, the uh, character animator, it wasn't so I could do the course and it wasn't for a gig. I thought, wow, this is really freaking cool. So I learned it. And then I started using it. Then I started getting paid to use it. Then I was paid to teach other people how to use it. Just keep learning and keep staying ahead and invest in whatever you can. Or, in fact, that's one of the great things about school. You have access to the tools you might not be able to afford otherwise. The problem I see is a lot. most people don't take enough advantage of what's available to them at those schools. You've got people like this at the schools. If you're not peppering him with questions, you're an idiot, because I'm going to be doing that later. Um, <laughs> now, it's, take advantage. I mean, when I, when I was in college, we had this great animation set up, and no professors who understood animation. So I was self-taught, but I used all the equipment, and I l taught myself how to use the equipment. I stayed up all night, because the classrooms were being used during the day, so I just stayed up all night long. And, and learned how to use it. In fact, my, my first, here, here's an example of, of how, to, how to move ahead. Because I'm, I'm going to really date myself. In the years before Photoshop, we had Rio. I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember Rio. It was one of the first paint programs. And there was, and I don't even remember what the original 3D program I was learning was. When I, I was at, at Universal Studio, I had an office at Universal in, in Orlando. And uh, I, was, I was designing at Nickelodeon. And there was one company that bought a, um, a digital paint system and a 3D system, but the owner didn't know how to use it, and he didn't have anyone on staff, but he was wanting to move into doing these things, and I found out about it. So after work one day, I went over and asked him if he could show me his system, because it sounded fascinating. I'll tell you, anytime you want to get something, just ask someone to show them what they have. People love to brag, love to talk about themselves, and love to show their latest toys, right? Always. So he starts showing me around all this stuff. I was like, God, this is great. What do you do? So I'm just starting to play with it. So I came back the next day. I said, you know, I've been thinking about your system. I'd love to learn it. Can I just come in on off hours and play with it? And he said, yes. So I didn't have to pay anything. This guy gave me a key to his office. I went in. I worked halfway through the night just learning his system. So then he lands a, uh, he sold a TV series called Firefighters on NBC. This is back in the early to mid-90s. And they needed a bunch of uh, uh, digital paint done on ATF photos, logos, and some 3D animation for it. And I was the only one who knew a system. So all of a sudden, because I was putting in the hours and learning it, I got my first network, uh, uh, my first network CG gig because I was the only one who was there and he knew me, which is the other point. You want to get gigs in all of this stuff, in whatever you're doing? Meet the people in the industry who are doing things. Part of that is like events, like coming to events like this, but not being a wallflower. It's working events like this. It's becoming a part of a CIFA and helping her put on events. Because if you're helping her on things, and she lands a gig or hears about a gig, because I, I, I see her do this all the time, and she needs people or she can refer people. She's going to refer people she knows who have proven that they are good to work with, that they're nice, that they're willing to put in the effort because we always hire people we know and trust. I have never hired an artist or an animator off uh, uh, by using an ad or placing something online. Not once in 30 years. And I've hired thousands of people. 
I hire people I know and trust. And if I go through that list and I haven't found it, I go to people I know and trust and ask them who they know and trust, and I find who I need. So if you're not one of those people who's known and trusted, it means you're sitting on your ass and sending out emails thinking that's going to get you a job, and it won't. You have to get out there, work, meet people, prove what you can do. Get off LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh, just to piggyback off of uh, what Mark Simon said, yeah, uh, there's a lot of great conventions out there too, like Seagraph, for example. It's a technology research uh, convention, and uh, people who go there are, do a lot of dissertations for like uh, technology of robotics, for example. And you find see new like software programs that they bring out. In fact, uh, when I was there, uh, there was a guy who had like this weird robotic arm thing that they put on you, and then you put on these yeah. goggles, and then uh, Ginger over there, for example, could like control the robot arms uh, and, and see through your eyes. And, uh, it, and uh, it was just really incredible uh, with what they're able to do. Um, and over there, you, you meet people from like, he, yeah, James was there and he was on, in a suit making weird faces. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and then uh, you meet people from EA, for example, you go on studio tours there, there's like time of cartoons. So you have all these ample opportunities just to do that. Uh, at Siege as well too, um, don't just go to just artist panels as well too, go to the Kickstarter panels. In fact, that's how I got my first job in board games was that I went to a Kickstarter panel and they're like, oh, we need a graphic designer. Can, can you do that? And I said, yes, I can. And you know, there you go. Uh, sometimes we go to other like art, just art related panels. There may be a lot of other people you're competing with as well too. But you never know if some CEO or some other person is looking for uh, someone with you know that uh, uh, the skills that you have. So yeah, like it really helps to talk to uh, to other people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're out of time, but I know that these people are really um, really nice. And usually, like I, except for Mark, he said he's not nice, but he quite is. So um, definitely, if uh, once. Yeah. Once, uh, one of the things that I would say that is that like usually we have to clear the room, but I would love for you guys to meet them outside the room, and maybe if you guys can stand around, like you know, take people's cards and things like that, that would probably be really great as well too, because I know a lot of people here might want to meet you as well. Anybody has contact info, please give it to me because like I said, I have to look Yes. Them. Yes. Please definitely um, come up and talk to them after the panel. And they have a lot of things going on all the time. Like Mark is always on a panel somewhere. Uh, and uh, if you want to see James, he's in GSU. GSU has a lot of different workshops, especially mocap workshops. And you can like, use their suits and things like that, too. So definitely. Yes, they have a lot of things, too. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for coming today. And I hope you guys enjoyed this panel. Thank you.